Egg Smoke. Matt Brown, publisher of Extra Points, part of the D1 Ticker family, joins us on 365 Sports. Craig Paul, I'm David Smoke. Matt, thank you for your time. And, whoa, your thoughts about well, Alabama's head coach. We know that story. And now what's happening with Iowa and Iowa State. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a wild uh, past couple of days here for anybody that is a little bit skeptical about uh, the influence of, of gambling within college athletics. Uh, I, I uh, re- remember here a couple of years ago, the NCAA commissioned a big study on the uh, on, on how many how many of their athletes and, and employees were participating in sports betting, uh, how many were engaged in in potentially problematic uh, you know gam- gambling behaviors. This was back in 2016, before sports betting was was widespread legalized, and they found that about a quarter of all athletes were were betting on sports. So I have to assume that that percentage has to be ticking up a little bit, given how much more ubiquitous gambling has become. And if it's a violation for any athlete to bet on anything, I don't think we, we should assume that this ends with Iowa and Iowa State, which, which I think are very different stories than what happened with Alabama. I wouldn't be shocked if over the next couple of weeks we find that hundreds of athletes throughout the country and in, in every state where this is legal. Uh, are, are being tagged now by, by requisite gaming authorities, and we should see similar press releases. Matt, what does the NCAA do moving forward here? It's a it's a really good question. Um, I and I, I don't I don't have a great answer, right? Like I think what happened with Alabama baseball is obviously very dangerous to the integrity of sports, but I have to think that that's probably a one off. The, the the person who is most likely to give inside information. To, to gamblers is not the guy making a half million dollars with the, with the most on the line. It's generally going to be a trainer. It's going to be an assistant coach who's making $29,000 a year on a baseball team, or it's going to be an athlete themselves. And my big concern here is not so much with college baseball, where you can't really even gamble on that in most of the country and the places that will take your money generally have a really low maximum bet. So it's, it's, it's hard for people to uh, you know, institutionalize betters to try to profit off that inside information. My concern is the same stuff where we've seen, you know, we saw it at Toledo about a decade ago. We saw it at Arizona State. We saw it at Tulane. It's a point shaving. And it's, I think particularly for point shaving at mid-major college basketball, where you don't need a lot of money to get someone to give you some inside information, to miss a couple of free throws, uh, or or to uh, to miss something for a prop bet, and even gambling regulators are saying that's pretty hard to catch. I think all the NCAA can do at this point is is educate and, and and let people know about the potential consequences of this of these actions. But this is a problem for professional sports all over the world. I imagine if 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 major soccer leagues are struggling with this, the A Sun and the Ohio Valley and and the Southland are going to struggle even more. Matt, as you pointed out, the Alabama, uh, you know, situation. Uh, who, who's betting on college baseball, right? You mentioned in, in a tweet I saw of yours earlier, going back and forth with somebody about just how low volume that probably is in general. So that can kind of jump off the page at you. So I guess some are easier to track down than others. But yeah, what yeah. kind of what kind of things do you even put in place to try to cover the, your other bases? I suppose. Yeah, and this is this is something I'm trying to report out and understand a little bit better. I'm I'm on a I'm on a big gambler myself, and I've been hitting the phones over the last week, even before this was happening, to try to understand this world more. You're right. Like I, here, I mean, I'm based in Chicago. At my local sports book, the one closest to me, uh, you know, down the street from the Big Ten headquarters, you can't place a bet on college baseball there. You can bet on like Finnish soccer and Korean basketball and a bunch of other weird stuff. But, uh, you know, even, you can't even bet on the on the lacrosse championships here where, where you can on FanDuel or some other places. But there, they, you know, it's, you can't place a bet for more than 250 bucks, more than 200 bucks. I, I would imagine for niche sports where there could be some information asynchronous, a uh, you know, imbalances, the, the, the books try to set low limits. But I don't really know if you can keep people from betting. All you can really do if you're a school or the NCAA – is to try and keep people from, from leaking inside information or from point shaving. You know, one thing that I think would help, and I understand FERPA makes this difficult, I think it would help if college sports had injury reports that were standardized and were given out in the beginning of the week so there's less value for a trainer or, or for some ops guy 
to, to tell somebody who has a hangover or, or who busted their hand earlier to get, to, to get it so they can get a jump on the lines. There's a reason pro sports do that, and I think college sports would be better if they did. Yeah, Matt, that's one of those things I think they've overthought, you know, and or have to accept now that, look, if you're going, not only that, if you're going to take all this big money from television, and then you're also yeah. going to want to get big money from DraftKings and FanDuel, you're probably going to have to. Yeah, and, and well, I think what we're already seeing now is many of those those schools are rethinking taking that big money, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it was, uh, uh, the last couple of weeks we've had Colorado wind down their relationship with points bet. Maryland is winding down their partnership. Michigan State is winding down from theirs. And the uh, the regulatory bodies overseeing casinos are already telling each other, hey, let's not do any more NIL deals with individual athletes, and let's, let's get out of the individual sponsorship deal with schools you know some conferences are going to try to go take some of the sports data money but you're already i think seeing some uh recoiling (laughs) once you realize what it means matt we lost you there for a second you there let me see here okay all right Matt Brown, extra points on the, one of the stories of the day. There's the Bob Huggins story in an interview with Cincinnati Radio that we discussed, and then also the story with Iowa and Iowa State Athletic Departments dealing with the stories involving allegations with student athletes and, and gambling. And one, I forgot which one it was, with a, a member of uh, the athletic department. Matt Brown rejoins us again on 365 Sports. Matt, uh, the reason I actually contacted you last week to get on the show is because it appeared out of Scottsdale there was some more at least interesting conference TV deal and realignment intrigue. Have you seen the the tide shift in a direction or the current shift in a direction that maybe you didn't expect or do you think that we're still status quo matt you there you know what it sounds like he's like on a roadcaster like i i i use now at home yeah. and it, it it's it's there but it's not uh it's there i wonder i was just looking up down matt's feed he built a bench over the weekend that was something he posted on his twitter feed um he did make a, there was a comment in reference to realignment coverage that john wilner made this this point uh and, and i know that whenever you say a certain name of anyone in media and i like john uh that doesn't mean i always agree with everything there's others that i don't agree with most everything they write but that Covering realignment is something that we're having to learn on who you really need to have as sources. And 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 it, it's different than covering a coaching change. Go ahead. I'm going to get to that with Matt after your, your question again, Paul. Okay, Matt, do we have you now? I think so. There, yeah, there, clearly, okay. clearly some, somebody in Chicago doesn't want us talking right now. But <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not the wrong guys. You got, you got some scary news there in Chicago. Uh, Matt, the um, – I, I, the reason I contacted you last week was about the Pac-12, what kind of went on at the, the conference meeting in, in Scottsdale. Have you seen the current yeah. change in any way uh, towards maybe realignment or uh, maybe even an actual media deal? Uh, no, candidly, I, I, I really don't think so. And what, what, what I can tell you from those meetings is, you know, I, I, I was not in Scottsdale. I texted a couple of ADs and I texted some people I know that work in the television industry the one thing that I heard very clearly, which I think we've seen now from a couple other national sources, is that the idea that ESPN is no longer interested in the Pac-12's premier programming is not true. Um, whether they are, you know, the, the, that conversation has shifted to a late night only package, whether a streaming company X has the upper hand, whether NBC or somebody else is popping in there, I don't know. And, and to be honest with you, it's so unlike any of the other television rights negotiations that I've covered. And I've, I've done this for a while for a bunch of leagues, big and small. Um, there's not there's usually nowhere near this uh, uh, this this amount of public chatter. So at, at this point, unless I hear it from a president themselves or from somebody that was directly in the room for those conversations, talks to me. I'm kind of I'm just in wait and see mode. I, I'm not saying that anybody's wrong. I just think that a lot of the updates that we're getting are from individuals that only have second or third hand information, and it's being kind of distorted a little bit from te- in the game of telephone. Matt, it, it's something I was going to ask you about. I saw your tweet uh, earlier, I think earlier today, perhaps about John Wilner mentioned the realignment. Yeah. Uh, 
have you ever seen realignment discussion almost become red states and blue states the way it's covered? <laughs> this is what's happening right now with with Pac-12 Twitter and and their associated you know bodies and Big Twelve. I, I think is pretty different than, than what it's been over the, the past couple of rounds. There might have been a little bit of this when the Big 12 was first considering uh, expanding and you would have uh, people affiliated with BYU and people affiliated with Houston and people with Boise State, you know, and have a, you know those sources fighting a little bit. But it's, it's definitely very different now. You also have like a, a, a third group of people, right? You have sources that are affiliated with Pac-12 institutional camps that are trying to get out one message, right? You have sources affiliated with the company, the broadcast companies, particularly those in the Amazon and Apple space that are not playing by the same rules that ESPN and Fox and CBS have done in this world. And there's a little bit of negotiating in public happening with them. And then you have voices that are affiliated with uh, sources connected to the Big 12 conference, which would obviously benefit if there is instability or fear within the Pac-12. And that, I don't want to say orchestrated messaging, but, but, but the way this is all going and the emotions tied to it are different than other realignments that, that I've covered. And, yeah, I think blue state or red state's not a bad way to think about it. Matt, as far as uh, on the NCAA front, obviously there are a lot of issues going on, as we've, we've talked about, and, yeah. and we haven't even covered them all. But uh, just as far as the, the, the strides being made or, or their direction, uh, anything to update, anything of note you feel as far as the NCAA and they're moving forward? Yeah, there's, uh, there's I think, two maybe smaller things that fans may be interested in right now. Um, uh, Charlie Baker has has brought in Bain and company, a big time, a management consulting firm out of Boston to do a thorough overhaul of the NCAA structure. You know, some of that I think is going to intersect with amateurism, but a lot of it's going to talk about revenue, um, and, and, and trying to modernize the way the institution does business. Uh, I don't, you know, you bring in somebody like Bain, you bring in the Kinsey and company, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but it's always, it's. It's not something that the NCAA would have done over the last 20 years. Um, they're also working with Endeavor uh, to figure out what they want to do with their next television package. And I, I had heard this even before the NCAA kind of made it, made it official from a few conference commissioners that they're expecting some updates on that in December. The big question there isn't just, hey, do we sell the women's basketball tournament as a separate championships package from everything else? But also, do we spin off baseball and softball? Do we care if some of our niche, other you know, smaller sports, uh, their championships are only on streaming or behind other paywalls? Uh, do we, or do we want to get into the championship broadcasting business ourselves? Put on, you know, NCAA championship app um, and take care of all the production. Build a studio in Indianapolis. Build a, you know, rent something in Burbank and and, and do some of the stuff themselves to return more money to members. Like I'm told, all of that's on the table right now. In addition to fighting with Congress, in addition to facing a couple of gigantic lawsuits, um, I would not want to be somebody working in Indy right now because there's a lot of existential questions on their plate. Well, they don't need to hire the Pac-12 network to do their own network. they got (laughs) to avoid that. But it would seem to make sense, though, to cut out the middleman on the um, unfortunately called non-revenue sports, wouldn't it? For, for, for some of them, you know, I've had some people tell me that, like, for example, tennis is apparently surprisingly expensive to broadcast. Uh, it, doesn't, it generates a very small audience, and ESPN only broadcasts it because they, they, they need to do that in order to get FCS football, in order to get the Frozen Four gymnastics. Theoretically, if you were to take on some of that production cost yourselves and then sub-license it to Flow Sports or sub-license it to somebody else, if you could do that effectively, that might make you more money. Um, that might provide a better product. That's what a lot of schools already do for their Olympic sports. You know, if you're, if you're an ESPN Plus kind of school, you're self-broadcasting a lot of your stuff anyway and just, you know, sticking it up on there. So, that's, you know, that's something to think about. And maybe if you can hire enough people at, at, a, at a good rate, it might even make sense to do that for some of these bigger sports. Like, that's, that's what they're trying to figure out right now. Matt, thank you for your time. Appreciate it as always. Uh, always enjoy the segment. Matt Brown, extra points with <laughs> always the, a pleasure. the D1 ticker with us uh, on